Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how everyday people can take everyday actions for a thrivable future where everyone lives in harmony with nature. Hi, I'm Kavya, a project manager by profession, and I've lived and worked in Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean, and I'm currently in Australia. I've seen how fragile our ecosystems are, and I think businesses have a big role uh, in addressing sustainability issues and um, given the scale at which they are able to operate. And I'm excited to host this with uh, Mike. Yeah, hi, Kavya. Thanks. I'm, I'm Mike. I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in policy and political science. I also have a passion for sustainability to address the concerns for the environment as well as the social issues that we currently face. And we are from the Thrive Project. It's a non-profit research institute, think tank and an advocacy group. Yeah, and Kavya and I will be your co-hosts as we talk with special guests about how we can create a thrivable life for all. Uh, before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples and as the first peoples of this place, now known as Australia, we respect the elders of the past and present and we are grateful for the continuing care of the land, waterways and skies where we listen, learn and thrive. Thanks, Mike. So today we are talking about greenwashing. You've probably heard this term a lot in the media, but what is it? How does it affect us and what can we do about it? So we would like to introduce our today's guest to talk about this a lot more, which is Lillian Vogelsang. She's a social media specialist within the Thrive Project, and she has much experience in seeing how greenwashing works and how people are affected by it. So welcome, Lillian. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, and good day, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> good day. Uh, so what is greenwashing? Um, I can go to the good old dictionary and where suffix refers the suffix called washing refers to the behavior of organizations that tries to make people believe that it is helping or protecting someone while they're actually not doing that. So greenwashing is these companies trying to make themselves appear more environmentally friendly than they really are. But what does greenwashing really mean to you guys? To me, greenwashing is turning a serious issue in a topic into a marketing buzzword to trick people into thinking that they are, you know, being more sustainable when it's all a lie. For me, it's really, you know, just frustrating on a conceptual level or on many levels, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And and for myself too, I think we, we see so many examples of it just on supermarket shelves in terms of, you know, labelling of things being uh, labelled as um, environmentally friendly when we know that many of the uh, companies behind it are not adhering to those standards. So yeah, we see it all around us and I think that's what um, it means to me anyway. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think that that frustration is what really triggered greenwashing into into a movement. Um, and I hope it, it really gets squashed by people. Uh, but personally, like what, what kind of issues have you seen around greenwashing that that you just can't stand? It's that sort of like marketing trickery. It's like when I look at, you know, a product and I'm looking for better options only to have these people claim, yeah, we are a better option. You can use us and it's fine. It's like we we don't have that impact only to, you know, turn around and be like, oh, I basically just fell for this scam. I fell for that, you know, that lie. And it kind of just, for me, it makes me just double, triple guess anything that I'm looking at to know like, hey, is this, you know, is this for real or is this not? Yeah, I was just going to say that it, it's, you know, how we say the information age has always become the fake news age. It's But it's this is more official business communication marketing, which is also fake. So we, it's just, that's what it sounds like to me. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And you get it. Um, you see it. You see it all the time, don't you? You see it in advertisements. You see it, as I said, on uh, supermarket shelves. You also see it in terms of damage control by um, companies when there is exposure of, of practices which are which are damaging. Um, I can think of a, a recent example, or in recent years anyway, of um, I think it was in the UK, in fact, uh, protests like no new oil, not wanting to have any new licences for, for new oil pro projects being um, created. And um, many of the protesters are seen in a negative light, and yet it's quite legitimate really what's being um, promoted here so so it can happen in a variety of ways from on the on the market level but also in terms of yeah how it engages with the media and the way public perception is impacted by it 
Yeah, that's true. But like what happens when we get greenwashed, right? One is the frustration that we just spoke about. But is is there more of a problem that that it creates? Yeah, um, I think I think that definitely. I think uh, in terms of um, when we look at things like uh, damage control as well, if we talk about where there has been exposure, um, there are instances where um, people can be very easily conned by not just uh, marketing ploys or, or advertisements, but there are even academic journal articles which are sometimes linked to industry. Not to suggest that they're even lying, but sometimes the um, the data itself can be framed in such a way which is more complementary to an industry um, without using a more holistic approach to appraising their operations and sustainability performance. With that level of like mistrust in the air, it's sort of like, you know, you created this product that's not made in a sustainable way and then claim it it is. There's also that sort of issue of apathy from the general public when, you know, oh, we're doing this so we are doing the right thing just buying this product when nothing is actually, you know, being done to make things better. It is essentially just lip service to, you know, oh, it's fine, we're good, don't worry about it. Yeah, and like the apathy is such an important point because most often people who who are not trying to live a sustainable life, most of the time they're not because they're like, oh, nothing's really true. There is no perfect sustainable way to live, so there's no reason to do that. And that's what they are trying to perpetuate even by greenwashing, and I think that that's a, that's a serious concern. And I feel like in addition to not just like cheating people, you're also actually cheating the environment. You're still continuing to do the harms. You're still ensuring that we probably don't live a good life on the planet. And you, and you also see it with like token gestures of, of, of companies or um, doing things like whether it's, you know, using plastic straws or whatever, or making some efforts to appear you know, eco-friendly, whilst the many other aspects of their operations uh, are appalling for the environment. Um, I, I can see that uh, in the uh, seafood industry. Um, and there have been documentaries like Sea Spiracy, which has been popular, which has exposed some of that, not just with the labelling of products as environmentally friendly when they haven't been, but there's a whole multitude of different areas of, of unsustainable practices. And um, Thrive has even conducted a study recently uh, looking into the sustainability performance of keystone actors within the seafood industry and found that um, a similar similar outcome where some um, companies would use some sustainability uh, measures like solar power whilst undertaking practices which are damaging the ocean floor or you know using unsustainable practices creating you know ocean pollution and, and, and runoffs and excessive antibiotic use which which can be dangerous and so there's a whole range of different areas but token gestures can give the appearance of being sustainable when it's covering up so many other operations which which aren't. And that, that's a real ploy that can be used as part of greenwashing too, I think, where it's not honest, uh, these kind of tokenistic gestures. Yeah, using green power to destroy the environment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Not poetic>. exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it shows a very interesting psychology here, right? Like, it's one, it's not a lack of information on, on the organization's perspective. They know what they're doing. They want to at least pretend to be green. But why are they not? Like, why do organizations not want to actually do it green? The easy answer would definitely be money. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. But I was, there's definitely a lot of, I imagine there's a lot of factors in it because there is a cost-cutting angle to it and then there's also like having a system that is set and at the end of the day, if companies will find a way for, you know, the people who benefit the most from the company, the people on top, to get the most money. They don't really, you know, care if they get that any other way, even if it is extremely unsustainable for the company itself. They're not stupid, like, you know, these companies that do this. They know exactly what they're doing, but when they, you know, it's one thing if they do it, if they just keep doing unsustainable practices and they just don't bother, but the ones that try to, you know, claim that, you know, level of greenwashing is because the consumer, especially the consumers are a lot smarter. The new generation of, you know, uh, Gen Z, millennials, and soon thereafter, they are a lot more conscious of, like, what's happening to the environment and unethical, you know, business practices, like blood diamonds. Like, the diamond industry has been suffering, you know, thanks to the new generation because of the mixture of, you know, 
people being aware of where those diamonds come from and the very unsustainable and very unethical practices, you know, to get those diamonds, as well as living in an economy where it's like too much to, you know, buy diamonds. But that's a whole other another conversation for another day. Yeah. Yeah, but I think for diamonds it's it's so true because even diamonds became so popular because of a marketing push to be like diamonds are forever or it's a girl's best friend and made it look like such a rare material that you have to own and it represents so many things. And it it is not as it has become deeply cultural today, but it always wasn't. You can make so, diamonds now. Like yeah. completely <laughs> lab run diamonds, which really just shows and like the the natural diamond industry hated that and we know why they hate that because that sort of just it reveals the truth of their con that they aren't special and you have to and like the the prices were always inflated it was always a lie and that's why like i would not believe for a second that they don't know what they're doing yeah it's a really interesting point you can see also how it, yeah, it, it can uh, tie to things like pop culture and the media and um you know like even looking at other industries like fashion or, or companies of that nature when we talk about unsustainable um, practices through, uh, you know, sweatshops and so forth and, uh, and environmental damage. And you can see that the same thing, that how it can link to the media and perceptions of, of what's desirable um, in the same way as diamonds uh, can. There's definitely that um, perception that these companies rely on in a whole range of different areas, I suppose. Yeah. And if I have to think about why, why they do it, right? Uh... Because at the end of the day, organizations are made of people and not everybody is necessarily evil and wants to really destroy the planet. It's just convenient to destroy the planet and continue to live. Yeah. And I do feel like at, at, at some level, it's also just the lack of change. We see it in political systems. We see it everywhere that there's so much resistance to change. Just in an organization, if you have to change one thing, uh, like a thousand processes need to change internally. We need to hire consultants to change processes. Yeah. We need to rehire people. We need to retrain people. So there's so much more things to do that it just doesn't feel like it's worth it because, you know, they are secured. It's not the future generations that they're as worried about as, as themselves today. I think that's definitely part of it. And I think with you see it particularly with some industries where it really is the, the entire, the operations of the industries are what needs to be changed there and mm -hmm. uh, where it's dependent upon practices which are destructive. So you see that in the seafood industry, you see it with certain other industries where a huge overhaul is required. It's just not sustainable no matter what um, ways, are, what approaches are taken. Are we, in contrast to other industries where innovation can be more, it can be made and they can try and use more sustainable practices because it's easier. And, and there are like businesses that are like from the ground up are looking for more sustainable options. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you've got. Um, it, it really does depend on the. Um, yeah, on on the on the different uh, industries and, and businesses. It's it's, um, and you will even have uh, businesses which use uh, sustainable business models, but their operations are still unsustainable despite that. And um, mm. yeah. It's oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah, do, do, is there an example of that? I, I I don't think I understand that really well. Yeah, well, again, just with not to go on about too much, but with the seafood industry as well, because it was a recent study conducted and looking at how the majority, um, so 30 keystone actors were uh, evaluated for their sustainability performance, but um, the, they had an incredibly low performance index, uh, the highest being only 50%, just over 50% of what it could be, um, with most being with many others being under 20%, like really appalling. But this is in the seafood industry. There's human slavery. There's a whole extreme environmental damages. There's a whole lot, lot of issues, a lot of issues with corruption and not reporting on on um, on problems as well, abuse and um, malpra malpractices. Um, but uh, most of them use green supply chain management, which is a sustainable business model. Mm -hmm. You know, so <laughs> it doesn't necessarily translate that um, just using the it shows that there are other factors uh, to be considered too and, and looking at things on that more, you know, looking at approaches which have an understanding of, say, strong sustainability or, or um, you know, taking a more holistic approach, understanding that um, there are finite resources and there is the requirement for regeneration, um, kind of 
would negate them being able to, um, if, if there was labelling associated with that, if we had that kind of monitoring or those kind of standards of oversight, that it, those kinds of practices which those industries, are, that industry I mentioned, those companies that I mentioned, uh, wouldn't be able to continue in that way. But because they're not employing that, the, the, um, their performance, their sustainability performance is really low. So there's not always that correlation between and that is that is appalling at the end of the day. Uh, so if you do look at like seafood, right? You, you explained an example of Seaspiracy as a documentary that came out on Netflix, and, and I think most of us have watched it. Even after it's out in the in public and people, there is an outrage. Does it have an impact, and has it changed things? I mean, that's just an example. But in general, do these activisms have any change? And if not, how do they control it? How do they manage to? Well, it's interesting because, um, yeah, because there was definitely a real strong social media reaction and a real controversy with that and lots of people damning it for being, you know, sensationalist and everything and, and claiming that some of the claims weren't correct. But but since then, subsequently, there have been other high-level uh, academic uh, journal articles which have highlighted that some of the claims made that has been expanded on, say, for instance, the Pacific Garbage Patch, which was alluded to having been... Uh, 50% of the buoyant debris in that linked to fishing gear. The subsequent study has shown that that's more like um, 75 to 86% linked to um, fishing, fishing, discarded fishing gear from, um, from China, uh, Japan, and South Korea. So, you know, the outcome is, and countries, you know, organizations like Greenpeace and what will reference this kind of data. So, it's the outcome of that, perhaps, if there's a correlation there, would say that it has prompted further investigation and, and, and academic studies, but there's definitely been a real effort for damage control. And you, you can also see that with, there was the other one, Cowspiracy too, which had a similar impact. I believe Glencore too has had, you know, similar, like a lot of outrage because of, you know, their methods and a lot of their unethical practices too. And here I've just been, I've been hearing a lot of advertising about suddenly how green they are. They're just, they're just so good now. And, but, and there's, they're also part of why we have minerals and stuff. So, like, don't worry about it. We're totally fine and not continuing what we're up to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is Glencore, uh, the mining firm, right? Yep. Yeah. So, like, the social media outreach it, as is one of the ways that that we can bring in change, right? Um, and I don't know if that to what extent it has worked or not worked in general. Maybe Lillian, you would have insights into it. And if so, why should people really look for social media or any such platforms to to express the unfairness that they see? In this day and age, I reckon when it comes to social media versus the past, it's a lot easier to go after companies because in an essence, in being, you know, trying to be part of the public, the the internet is a new public space for everyone. And they have to be a part of it to connect to the people. But at the same time, in stepping in, they're also stepping into the arena of, you know, being criticised. The moment you, you know, they speak something up and make claims, people are going to have a look at that. And either there's going to be people who, like, trust them on their word. But more often than not, in this day and age in the internet, people are going to question you. People are going to, like, look at what you do and people, you know, who've maybe worked in the past or seen what they do, they're going to pull up those receipts. Yes. Uh, and you're in that arena, they're going to find those receipts and they're going to, you know, bring it up. And the internet is a good place to really sort of like, you know, drum up as much public as attention as possible. The problem it is is when, you know, when it's being forgotten because yeah. you can unfortunately sort of like be you know forgotten because they have their 15 minutes of you know fame fame (laughs) or infamy in this (laughs) and then they can you know try to be forgotten and they move on to the next target what needs to happen is that is people keeping that remembering that you know this is what they've done this is a company this is not you know a person this is a group that's going to try to you know get as much money as they possibly can out of a subject and use whatever they can to keep on sustaining, even if it means extremely unethical practices. And the only way to, you know, have change is to force change. 
They're not going to do it because, oh, I guess it's the right decision. I guess it's technically, you know, what the ethical thing is. Unfortunately, no. The only way, you know, people seem or things do change is if they're held accountable to it. And social media as sort of like this public space can be used to do that. Yeah, and I think interestingly when um, a lot, like some of the firms end up just, oh, we're going to hire the head of so-and-so, the CEO, or somebody like steps down um, as a reaction, but that does not mean everything internally changes. And uh, I remember you telling you talking to me about this some time back about how personalities are pulled down more easily than organizations. Hmm. It's easier to you know, attack a face than it is a corporation because a corporation is extremely nebulous. It's this thing, sort of like it, and you you can't grasp your mind around something that's like bigger than you are. That's just this sort of like thing, mm. as opposed to a personality who is say unlikable or they did something or just to even have a face it's easier to sort of take that step down yeah. which is the trouble of being careful of like oh this ceo has you know stepped away after being you know doing a big kerfuffle but it's fine now okay. when when reality you're right it's that's not necessarily it because like just because that one person is gone it doesn't stop the network from doing exactly what they're doing but now a lot more quietly and just stepping away from the public eye. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, someone becomes the full person and they just continue on doing what they were doing to begin with. Um, yeah. It's only social media backed up with a lot of the academic journals and continuous pushes from, you know, the public together that real change can happen versus token change yeah absolutely yeah and i think the social media push also does an other side of how to change it which is their teams internally need to realize that this is a problem like it's the marketing teams the sales teams that say that people are not buying this product they are you know doing this whole marketing or they're not marketing they're just expressing on social media which itself is reaching more people than your marketing campaigns are so you know that we need to change something. We need to, people no longer want to buy this. So that's another push or a way for the organizations to be conscious. And um, I don't know what are other ways in which people can ensure that they are not being greenwashed. Well, there is a way that I know helps. But first, I kind of want to add a disclaimer for everyone that like we have to be as a public very aware of like these tips or these, you know, sort of tricks that marketing do. But at the same time, it's like until we have like, you know, a lot more like interventions from third parties more so. And I think like transparency, right? Like yeah. either force transparency or be able to actually ensure that there are somebody else bringing this system to be more transparent. Exactly. Um, as a consumer, we can only, you know, do so much as we can. We can try to be aware of the tricks and look for, say, keep an eye out for, you know, third party certification like Fairtrade, the Rainforest Alliance and Certified Humane are like really good ones to keep an eye out. Anything else that just says like, oh, we are totally green or we're a hundred percent sustainable but like no other certification mm -hmm. that's just pretty package it's you know it's not proof that like you know if there is no certification to say this is you know we did this a certain way we were checked this is all like the this is all you know the ticks and everything you know mm -hmm. every t crossed every box ticked then that's just pretty marketing yeah i agree and i think in terms of information there should be more uh sources that people can go to that that explains better mike i think you are a policy expert and you do know of more sources than most people do so are there anything that you would you would suggest that people should follow well i think i think like as lillian was saying having independent certification is obviously really important like like mm -hmm. in the same way with fair trade and probably free like labeling we need that kind of approach but even when it comes to things like academic, academic journal articles and and having independent and objective articles and, and only listening to you know to, to these if, if, if something's linked to industry obviously it can it should be uh, questioned uh, and you know discounted when needs be you know there, there have been studies which have used uh, proper science to expose how that there's been limited approaches in in some studies uh, there's an example with animal agriculture for example and talking about you know deforestation 
and how previous um, articles, for example, had, had only account considered ongoing effects of, of, of deforestation and the ongoing effects of uh, animal agriculture on greenhouse gases and not the historical and regenerative approach, which gives a completely different context in the way that that data is framed and the way in which the situation is exposed and can be dealt with. So obviously the framing of data is, is essential to be understood, but looking at it through having understand having independent and objective studies and not ones which are linked to industry as integral. And I think I think it would be yeah vital to have independent bodies investigating this as well. Because um, you know we, we have this in, in many areas of, of governance in regard to policy in terms to you know government processes in terms of having uh, independent bodies review things and i think this is something else which is required we see that with many industries where they have a review of of practices and if it's not independent it cannot mm -hmm. be trusted and, and we, we see this all the time and this is a, a constant issue that we see with many unsustainable uh, industries um, you know, across a whole range of areas and it's something that's often called for yeah and i think at strive we have kind of published some of these sources that people could could go into especially in terms of certifications and things so might be a good good source as well yeah. um in addition i think i also think of just people's voices like because it comes down to what can we do of course it's not consumers who are responsible for it it's still the businesses and the industry that needs to be responsible but another thing you could do is kind of come together with your local municipal or uh, just communities and try and ensure that you can put this voice across in your own space and the people that you know so they are also not greenwashed and together you're more wary like us in this discussion learn more from each other's uh, conversations than we do uh, maybe just by ourselves doing research half the time yeah yeah and i think yeah absolutely and i think not uh, maybe the public not being to having more mindfulness about how, how this the consistency of these approaches and not having too much of a haphazard approach to being concerned about sustainability, but to understand just how determined many companies and industries are in continuing their practices and to, to not buy into much of the, the discourse that we see in the media and, and just to try and retain a more objective viewpoint um, and not buy into what what we see through the media and even in some cases what we see online. And, and as Lillian was saying, be, being a bit more sceptical about what companies and industry might be promoting. I think greenwashing is such a such a prevalent uh, issue across so many products and, and sectors that we could actually talk about it for much longer than, than we actually have, but we might have to wrap it up. Yeah, Lillian? Sorry. I'm just agreeing with you. Like, it's such a wide-reaching, you know, topic that it's sort of like, because it's, you know, linked essentially with environmentalism as a whole it's intrinsically linked in so many different industries like we talk a lot about the fishing industry but there are so many industries that if you just lift up the rock and it, and just and you just see everything that's underneath it will just be you know so much so much just in terms of just environmental damage or unethical practices just to people alone much less of course unethical practices in general to just animals in the environment we could we could honestly just go on you know forever about this sort of, and all the different aspects it weaves into it's so big but it's also just great to you know take one step out at a time with the subject that in that you know what we do and what we've been you know doing here i feel like the fact that greenwashing exists in some way is a twisted positive that companies know that's what we want we want change and so they pretend to change. So if we keep, you know, speaking up and, you know, pointing out that hypocrisy, they will be forced to make the real change. Thank you so much. I think that's such a perfect ending to this, uh, to this conversation. And it does mean that we can change and organizations can change too, because they already are trying. It. Thank you so much um, for, for having this discussion with me. Uh, Mike, do you want to... Yeah, just, yeah, thank you, Lillian, for, for being part of this discussion. I mean, we've covered a lot. Thank you for having me. Yeah, really valuable um, discussion we've had. Maybe we would like to finish off with uh, one short passage. It just seemed like greenwashing is a lot like being conned out of your savings, but in this case, it's the future that we're losing. And when you find out that a company has been conning you into giving your goodwill to them, practically stealing your ability to support a truly green company or product, that hurts. But with discussions like this one, we can be more informed and avoid falling into those traps. 
Um, we want to make sure that our desire to do the right thing is well spent. And we know that they are changing because that's why greenwashing exists, as Lillian uh, summarized. So thank you for joining us. And you will find all the resources that we discussed today in the podcast notes. Uh, stay tuned and see you next time. And as we say here, keep on thriving. <laughs>